Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Nearing. I'm with the Leadership Institute. We're delighted to uh, be a partner in this uh, New Direction uh, Think Tank Central uh, Defending Freedom Conference. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by a distinguished panel for a discussion on the Abraham Accords uh, and, uh, and the future of the Middle East in the post-Abraham Accord uh, era, or in the era of the Abraham Accords. Uh, first, I'd like to start with uh, some self-introductions to familiarize you with the members of the panel. We'll start with Mitchell. Uh, firstly, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mitchell Belfer. I'm the uh, founder and president of the Eurogulf Information Center based out of uh, Rome, uh, with a branch in uh, Brussels as well as in Stockholm, uh, trying to not only uh, look at the European relationship to the Middle East, but also uh, to try to anticipate what comes next. And I uh, look very much uh, forward to discussing with my uh, fellow panelists about the uh, post-Abraham Accords uh, Middle East. Hello, everyone. I am Thomas. Um, as you can see up there, I am Director of Research at the Henry Jackson Society, which is a London-based foreign policy and national security think tank that was founded in Cambridge around 20 years ago. And again, I'm very uh, pleased to be here today to speak with you all about the Abraham Accords. Good afternoon. My name's Tom. I'm the Director of Outreach at the Pinsker Centre. We're a foreign policy think tank that's been going for seven years, and we work to cement ties between Britain and our Commonwealth with Israel, as well as combat anti-Semitism and promote free speech on university campuses in the United Kingdom. The very first time that I ever travelled to the region was with the International Republican Institute and it was to train um, independent Palestinian women candidates running in the Palestinian elections of 2006. Uh, and since then, I've taken a great deal of interest uh, in the area and found uh, the Abraham Accords to be you know, absolutely dramatic, but particularly they're most dramatic when viewed against uh, what the prevailing left-wing view of the, of, the, of the region and its issues were. We had heard for years that uh, for example, that the U.S. the U.S. could never move its embassy to Jerusalem because that would mean the end of the world, uh, and uh, and we also heard that absolutely no progress of any kind could be made on any issue until there was a Palestinian state, uh, and that turns out to be a hundred percent incorrect. So my first question is to the Thomas closest to me, and that is, does the left have any credibility left? when it comes to these issues of how the West should relate to the Middle East and the internal dynamics of the, the ongoing Middle East situation? Elements of the left don't. You're absolutely right. Um, you're quite right when the when elements of the left were talking about the fact that, oh, we need to recognize Palestine. Well, hang on, they've had five opportunities to... Um, to accept a Palestinian state, and they didn't take any of them, whether it was the Peel Commission, the UN, uh, US-mediated uh, peace talks. Um, the Palestinians refused five times, uh, often violently. So, um, and, and the left has been, or elements of the left, I should say, have been cheering them on in that. So in elements of the left have zero credibility at all. Some more moderates, so you know, Bill Clinton, for example, who was one of the presidents who... Uh, who presided over peace talks. Um, yes, I'd say more moderate left-wingers in at least the Anglosphere have credit, have still have a lot of credibility, and I respect them a lot, but, uh, but certainly elements of the far left uh, have zero credibility. Uh, Mitchell, let me ask you something real quick, and that is that um, what insight could you lend on the genesis of the Abraham Accords? And I think this goes to your experience as well in terms of this was signed uh, and agreed upon and presided over by President Trump, but I doubt that he initiated this. This was, uh, the, uh, there had for many, many years been discussions under the table about cooperation between Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Israel and the UAE and Israel on security matters. They have a common adversary in Iran. Share with us a little bit of insight on, the, on how this got started so we can use that to provide some perspective for the future. 
Thanks. It's a great question because, to be honest with you, um, from the founding of the State of Israel in 1948, we have to distinguish different parts of the Middle East because it's not one big region. Actually, there's many um, kind of sub-regions within there. And the countries of the Arabian Peninsula, so we're talking about the six GCC countries, um, they have not really had a, a hostile relationship to Israel on the nation-state level. That's not to say that there has uh, not been, for example, feeders from some of these countries over the decades in terms of uh, more extreme versions of Islam, uh, which have, uh, of course, identified Israel as an, as an enemy. But the countries themselves and their government structures have been, I think, uh, quite... Uh, engaged uh, under the table, as you said. Um, some of them not so not so uh, dark or deep under the table. Uh, many of their relations is uh, like a public secret. Uh, we know that they had deep. We know they had communications. We just didn't. Maybe they didn't broadcast them so much. Uh, particularly with the United Arab Emirates. I mean, their relationship goes back almost fifty years. And so the leading discourse is to call it normalization. Uh, but a good friend of ours from the United Arab Emirates uh, coined the term formalization. And so we shouldn't look at it as as something that became a normal relationship, just the formalization of something that existed before. Saudi Arabia is not a signer of the Abraham Accords. But do you think that if the government in Riyadh was opposed, the UAE would have signed it anyway? Uh, no. I think to, to be f fair, especially on uh, Saudi Arabia, it's going through tremendous change. Um, it's modernizing at a, ra at, at a pace that I think it's difficult for us to understand. Uh, it's, it's emerging as a new country. Um, and Riyadh did not have any objections either to Bahrain or to the United Arab Emirates. And you, we could be sure that, in fact, uh, they were briefed every step along the way. There's no way that any of the Gulf countries would want to alienate Saudi Arabia. It's by far the largest economy. It's by far the most populous country there. Uh, and it's, it's the key. Actually, it's the key to the region. And so uh, they were briefed every step along the way. So even though they're not a signer, they're still part of the equation and would be, and are certainly not on the hostile side, or else it simply would not have happened because these countries are in their, yeah. uh, in their orbit. I want to give the Thomas further away from me a chance to hop in on these two questions. So um, on, on the first question, as, as we've spoken about, um, to some extent, it, it does highlight previous failures, failures across the political spectrum, I think. Um, and maybe this is an unpopular thing to say in, in the, with the current audience, but I don't think it's necessarily a failure on the left. And I think the success of the Abraham Accords is, is very much that it moves beyond, beyond that kind of politicized type agreement and it looks at something that relegates those famously very political issues into a second place in terms of the discussion and it looks to people to people engagement economic en engagement uh, as a means to move towards that formalization of relations and move to more interlinked and cooperative relationships in the region um, that really transcends and moves beyond that political divide um, so I, I don't think it necessarily um, it highlights our failure to have done that before and to look at this new means of people-to-people -people engagement, economic cooperation as a way towards a natural process of socializing into those um, foreign relations, uh, that formalized uh, process. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's the key takeaway from the Abraham Accords. And in its early days, but I think we, we've already seen that that process of economic integration is, is really taking off in a way that we haven't seen with previous agreements that were far more politicized. So on that, let's talk about getting beyond the, 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 politicis the politicized uh, element. There were many people on the American left who chided President Donald Trump for having moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to the capital of Israel, where the government actually is. Uh, and yet the Biden administration has not reversed that decision uh, at all. So what do you make of that? If I jump in again, I think that, that the fact that the Biden administration has not rode back just demonstrates the success of this non-politicized approach. Because with previous agreements, I think it's, there's a lot of personalities involved there and, and everybody would like to be seen to be the one who, who jumps in 
and creates some kind of new formalized diplomatic arrangement to 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 overcome those political differences in the region um but this has just left space for that politics to be removed and and for biden to quite comfortably continue uh, with with the Abraham Accords, although, although I, I would note that what needs to be done is is more on the side of things that we saw at the beginning, and we need to keep concentration on things uh, such as the, the the Abraham Fund and making sure that that states are ready to step in to really keep this engagement going and stimulate those long lasting economic ties, whether that be on a high level or um, the kind of level of the populace. And I think it's important to, to keep working uh, beyond the, the signatures of the agreements to make sure we contribute to that process. So the, the United States took the lead in moving the embassy to, um, to Jerusalem. The world did not end. Uh, several countries followed, Guatemala, Honduras, um, and, uh, and others have, have discussed it. Thomas, closest to me, um, the Jerusalem Post this morning is reporting that the UK is now considering moving the UK embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Given the recent leadership changes in Europe, such as in the UK, Sweden, we just saw election outcome within the last week there, uh, with a very different philosophy between the, the ruling, who will be the new ruling party versus the old, what changes might we see coming from the UK, Sweden, and other countries in Europe toward Israel and toward toward the, the wider region? Of course. Um, I'm very optimistic. And, uh, oh, by the way, uh, you called me Thomas. Um, please, it's it's Tom. I haven't been called Thomas since I was naughty as a child. As so. you wish. <laughs> um, but, yes, I'm very optimistic um, for the way in which uh, we are recognising Jerusalem as the capital of Israel at last. I think it's a recognition of the truth, um, and a, a recognition of reality and a pragmatic step um, to foster positive relations with Israel. Um, I was pleased to have voted for Liz Truss in that leadership election as a member of the Conservative Party. Uh, I think she'll do a great job. Um, and I think this is great news. And I am very, very, um, I'm very certain that it will go ahead. I'd be very shocked if it didn't. Um, she's got to battle the many staff in the Foreign Office over it. Um, I think those battles are being won, though, and I'm very optimistic for the future. So, so just to put you on record, you believe that the UK will move forward to move its embassy to Jerusalem following the US, Guatemala, Honduras, etc.? That's my prediction, yes, and I'm fully in support of the move. What does the rest of our panel think? Mitchell? Uh, c can I actually just uh, maybe... Uh Di uh, divert for one second? You may. Um, so, actually, I think if we look at uh, the Jerusalem move um, by the Trump administration, it also showed a great deal of foresight, because if we're looking at a two-state solution, which I'll come back to in a second, we, uh, Ramallah, for example, is a half an hour drive, uh, and having an American presence there, even if they don't open an embassy, for example, in Ramallah, when there's you know, a, a Palestinian state uh, securely beside Israel, um, so they would be able to actually service both countries through a single embassy. And so it's much smarter than having to go from Tel Aviv to Ramallah. Uh, you would be able to service. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit more forward thinking, I, I believe, uh, big picture. Um, but speaking about the two-state the two solution, um, and here we can go back to your original statement about the left, uh, I mean, they have zero ability of self-reflection. We now talk about a three-state solution because the people that they support, Hamas, declared essentially a whole new state in Gaza. And when we talk about the left and the failure to understand what has happened in the region uh, or fail to recognize, for example, how their policies have failed um, the people of the region, um, we can't talk about a two-state solution because it doesn't exist on the ground. Now there are three entities. There's Israel, there's Palestine, and then there's Hamas running Gaza. And that's a, f that's a fundamentalist state there. And so now the gap is so much bigger because of these uh, failed policies. So the Jerusalem move is foresight. How long will it take? Well, as long as it takes until uh, you know the Palestinian state is also unified, which could be decades, could be decades and decades into the future. So also looking at the Jerusalem Post this morning, uh, there was a report that uh, the current prime minister, 
uh, will embr- it will speak at the UN uh, General Assembly meeting uh, and uh, and state from the podium uh, Israel's and his support for the two state solution, which is something that has not been spoken of from the podium at the UN in probably a decade uh, or more. It seems to me, having been to the to Israel and the West Bank many many times, that. The circumstances on the ground have changed dramatically uh, since um, the uh, Bill Clinton's genuine effort to reach accommodation between Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat uh, at the cl- in the closing months of Bill Clinton's um, uh, presidency. So my question is: Is a two-state solution, as originally envisioned, even plausible on any level, given the fact? Uh, of the number of Israeli citizens who would have to move out of their homes, uh, of which there are very significant uh, settlements, towns, however we want to call it, that are present uh, in what the Palestinians consider their territory in the West Bank. I'll start with you, Mitchell. It's it's a fascinating, not only is it a fascinating question, but it's a fascinating topic um, because demographics, it, it's a very strange phenomenon what's happening in Israel. The wealthier they get, the more children that they're having. And that's the exact opposite trend in, in other uh, Western countries, that the wealthier people become, the less children that they have. Um, and so do, Israel is now a country of nine million people. Um, and if you go and you look at the geographic or geopolitical depth that they have, geostrategic depth, it's a very, very small country as well. Um, I do think that y- there could be a, a land swapping arrangement. I, I know they've been talking about it. Um, but again, you'd have to get the two sides of the Palestinian territories to agree on what their state looks like. Um, I know the Israelis also floated the idea of creating a land bridge uh, between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, um, which would essentially be something about uh, eight eight meters or ten meters above the ground, uh, and secured through the the entire corridor would be secured by the Israelis. But it would link and it would get rid of this uh, the territorial uh, uh, kind of almost disfiguring of uh, what what a Palestinian state would look like. But things have changed. I mean, Israel is not uh, five million, six million people anymore. It's nine million people. It's a big country, and they don't don't have very much space. Uh, You can see it if you go there. Um, What they've had to do, for example, in the deserts um, and the the infrastructural projects that they've had to try to to develop in order to link, um, you know, link link their people together, but also to to build uh, a modern modern state. So I think you're right, it's going to be very difficult um, to, to, to move mass m- movement of people and you won't get that. So they'll have to find uh, other, maybe more innovative solutions. Thomas Kira, let me, uh, let me continue that, uh, that line with you. Um, you have the rise of Hamas. Uh, you have Islamic Jihad, uh, which has gained a great deal of prominence recently. You have a weakened President Mahmoud Abbas and a weakened Palestinian Authority. Um, Combining that with the changes on the ground, the facts on the ground, um, what does a two-state solution look like? Everyone's, you know, Joe Biden's talking about it. The Prime Minister of Israel will talk about it today. What would that, even, what would that even look like if that were? And, and is that something which would just be stillborn, or is that, or what is? Is there a two-state solution that is viable, and what would that look like in your opinion? I, I think the answer is um, touching on what Mitchell has, has said. I don't want to repeat, but I, uh, what that would look like is very difficult to say at this moment in time. And it's right to say that Israel has, has changed, but by virtue of the accords and these increasing economic integrations in the in the region, you just look at the takeoff in trade that has happened over the past two years because of the accords. Um, Israel will continue to change, um, not necessarily demographically, but in terms of uh, dependency, regional dependency, dependent on these economic integration and ties that come about because of the accords. Um, So in terms of a two-state solution, I think we need to look at where the Abraham Accords actually lead in terms of the regional relationships that Israel has and the Palestinian Authority has, and then revisit the issue after we go through this process of economic integration um, that is happening through the Accords. And I think, again, that's that's very much why it's important that the Accords are coupled with support mechanisms to ensure that young people 
are involved in those uh, exchange activities, both economically and in people-to-people -people exchanges, um, so that looking more long-term, we can go back and approach those very political issues on the ground in a new scenario which will give new blood to those arguments and those debates and, and allow us to approach that issue that has obviously not uh, reached a resolution um, with a very different political makeup um, in the region. Well, you brought it back to the Abraham Accords, so let me move a step further uh, in that direction. When I was in Jordan, it became very clear that Jordan and Israel have a cold peace. Uh, however, that stands in very stark contrast to what you see in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi, uh, particularly uh, following the Abraham Accords, where uh, it, it's very different. So in in the, the main newspaper in, in Abu Dhabi is The National, and regularly uh, you would see in The National uh, very pro-trade um, and uh, pro-Abraham Accords coverage and, and the like, making a really, really big deal out of this. I mean, this is not a cold piece. This is a very warm piece. So my question for each of you, starting with Tom uh, and then moving down the line, were you surprised by this warm peace flavor that this has taken on following the signing of the Abraham Accords? Were you surprised, and why were you surprised or not surprised? Um, to be honest, I'd, I'd qu quite like to change the question. I was optimistic for this result, and I'm pleased that it's happened. Um, Are you I running for office? <laughs> 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 no, go on. No, no comment. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was very optimistic for this result, and I'm very pleased with it. You know, trade between Israel and the UAE, for example, is now 1.2 billion dollars, uh, and in 2021 it rose uh, by 551 percent uh, on the previous year. So I think that goes to say the extent to which economic integration as a result of the Abraham Accords is helping those two countries and more importantly the people of those two countries. Israel has amazing exports in water conservation, uh, in science and technology, um, agriculture, particularly their wine in the Golan, that's rather nice. Uh, amazing exports and the people of the UAE are now getting to embrace those exports and vice versa. Um, so it's hugely positive uh, and I can see that um, I think the only way is up. Thomas, were you surprised or not surprised? I don't think I was necessarily s surprised to, to see that level of economic in integration because once you take the the ball and chain off that process as as we've we've touched upon there's so much potential there and it makes sense that you'd see those those rapid increases in in trade in in the region um again i, I think the importance is those partners out you know that includes european partners outside uh, the signatures of the agreement to, to lean into that process and make sure it doesn't go cold because it's all very well uh, having that peak in trade over the past two years. Um, but it's about looking at what exactly what the breakdown of that trade is and ensuring that it's it's a, a diverse in the sense of, of where that economic integration is happening uh, so that you get uh, broadly across the demographic in those states um, that the benefits are, are seen uh, for, for, for all parties in that sense, uh, because to actually change politically on the ground uh, perspectives in, in the region and, and keep it warm and make it a success, uh, you know, the, the, the benefits of that increase in trade, uh, that increase in people-to-people -people interaction, technology sharing, knowledge sharing across borders needs to happen in a way uh, that's equitably distributed uh, and, and has a long-lasting effect. And, and that's how we keep it warm, uh, because the danger of if it's a short-term boost in trade integration uh, between uh, you know, large established firms and economic players in, in the signatories, um, it, that's going to have less of an, an effect in keeping this, this warm increase in relations uh, as it would do if, if it benefits ac across the populace again. And I think that speaks to, to your point about changing demographics and, and ultimately um, it has to you know, cement those ties in a long-lasting fashion with, with the next generation. You use the term leaning in, uh, and just a, a visual which really struck me is 
walking into, um, and I've been going regularly to the UAE since 2007, but walking into an, a grocery store in Dubai and being greeted with a huge Israeli flag made of flowers with all Israeli agricultural products uh, in the supermarket arrayed around it is the type of thing which would not happen if the, if, um, if the government didn't want that type of thing or did not approve of that type of thing happening. So just the visual shock of seeing that to me was, it was very significant. Uh, and uh, you know the the business sector has an understanding of what the what the government approves of and doesn't and so on. So you know there are signals there, even though there's not a formal instruction. You know you will do this, um, Mitchell. What were you surprised? Not surprised? Um, well, first, if I may, to, the contexts are very different. The Jordanian and also the Egyptian they came out uh, out of decades of conflict, war, open conflict with the Israelis. Um, the demographic in Jordan is uh, more than 65% Palestinian. Um, so they have their own, I think, context as to why relations haven't warmed at the same pace. Uh, but I should also say there's been change in Jordan as there has been in Egypt uh, in terms of their normalization process with Israel on the backs of the Abraham Accords, because what they're seeing is an, an, a newly emerging region. They're looking at Bahrain, they're looking at Emirates, they're looking at Morocco, and they, want, they also want a piece of this energy, because it's not, it, you know, you can't attract uh, investors and you, you, you can't become a startup region, forget startup nation, you can't become a startup region unless you are stable and safe and open and this is what is happening, and this is why the leadership in the UAE and the leadership of Bahrain and of Morocco, they took a huge step. It's risky, it's sensitive, but they knew that doing it now can, has the potential to reshape this region. And that's, what's the, pro, that's what proce the process is going on now. And the Jordanians look at it and they want in as well. They know what constraints they face at home domestically, but they want a piece of this, uh, of this pie. Well, the way you describe that brings up the point that, uh, and some of my colleagues have discussed this at great length, in that everyone in politics and government calls themselves a leader, right? I'm a leader, you're the leader, everybody's a leader. But the reality is most of them really aren't leaders. Most of them are just followers, and they're following either public opinion or they're following somebody else uh, rather than driving the dynamic and changing public opinion or moving it in a different direction. Uh, and I think your point is spot on concerning the value of that openness, transparency, rule of law, and so on in terms of moving your country forward. Morocco wants petitioned to join the EU. They were politely told no. We call it the European Union for a reason. Uh, but, uh, but the fact that Morocco once expressed an interest in joining the EU gives an indication of the direction where, you know, where the king is going. Um, I was discouraged when I looked at the public opinion in much of the Arab world concerning normalization of relations with Israel. Uh, the data that I reviewed this morning indicated that in Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, support for establishing relations with Israel stood at about 10%. The, the country with the highest level of support, which was still only 30%, uh, was in Lebanon. Uh, and then everyone else was down from there, Iraq about 10%. So my question for everyone on the panel, and feel free to jump in, is what impact will uh, public opinion, will the Arab street, as it's often uh, called, what, what impact will that have on moving forward and building upon the, Abraham's, the Abraham Accords? I think perhaps the best thing to do um, is kill people with kindness. Um, you know, in, in much of the Arab world, uh, including um, uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, in schools, you know, children are taught um, really quite demonizing things about Jews, about Israelis. Um, it's really quite disgusting. And you know, if you look at some of these books, some of the propaganda, it's like something out of 1930s Germany. It's really awful. So they've been taught this stuff, many of them from a very young age, and I think that takes time to sort of unlearn. 
and actually come to a realization of the truth in that actually you know these people don't have three heads and they don't eat children um and actually that's just a load of really quite poisonous lies uh, so i think it's going to take time for that to, to come to fruition but again we kill them with kindness the increase in trade of 551 percent between the uae in one year um i think can help contribute to that as you said uh, was it in dubai the supermarket with uh, israeli flowers um with loads of israeli wonderful israeli agricultural products well the people of dubai will be buying these products and thinking oh gosh this is delicious this is absolutely wonderful why didn't we do this before so i think that's that's the way that we build um not not, not just prosperous economies not just a prosperous trading relationship but actually that's the way we change hearts and minds too Thomas? Well, I think speaking as, as, as you term it to the, to the Arab street and public opinion uh, in those countries, again, just, just touches on this point that um, the, the benefit, benefits of that, those increasing trade relationships have to be felt by the younger generation and uh, by those people on the ground that are going to ultimately be the the arbiters of the fate of, of the elites that have come to these agreements. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, very clear, uh, obviously, that trade in agricultural goods is, is wonderful. As you look at trade statistics in uh, 21, um, between UAE and Israel, you're looking at uh, precious metals and precious stones being traded, worked and unworked, and that's making up a large proportion of that trade. Um, but where we need to build on the accords is continuing the work of what the Abraham Fund looked to do is, is start, as we've touched on, a, a kind of culture of, uh, if you want to term it, a startup culture, but you can talk about promotion of innovation and technology sharing and knowledge sharing across these countries um, that benefits the bro w wider population. Because you say, obviously, in, you go into the supermarket, they may buy... Uh, produce that has is available to them by virtue of this increasing trade but I think actually what will change hearts and minds is opportunity and not necessarily commodity um, that comes about because of these these new trade arrangements but a, a kind of tangible opportunity for young people um, and they will see that if you if you promote this knowledge and technology exchange uh, that's broadly shared across the population and, and creates that opportunity uh, then public opinion will slowly change i'm i'm sure mitchell it, it's it's uh, i think a multi-layered question in the end because um first i should say i'm very skeptical about statistics coming out of the middle east uh, i feel that they're very often politicized by their nature uh probably the 30 percent uh, lebanese were the 30 percent christians that are left there uh that sampling because uh, the lebanese who have known the israelis very well uh, st are still a very uh, religious and sectarian based society and I would suspect that the 30% are the same 30% that wanted to make peace with Israel already in the 1940s and 50s. Um, of course it was a bigger percentage in those years and now it's uh, down quite a lot. But I think that there there are um, some important, I wouldn't say the, the Arab streets so to speak, but there is a, a, a very important socialization um, and not only of Israel, but of Jewish people in the Middle East. And if you go to Saudi Arabia, you go to the, you know, they, they've started to recover this al Ula area, and they have a couple of ancient Jewish uh, villages that are there, and they're unearthing these, uh, and it's become part of their culture to be able to recognize the Jewish presence on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, if you go to Bahrain, they've had a thriving Jewish community there for 200, more than 200 years, uh, since the sacking of Basra uh, by Iran, of course, 200 years ago. So, you know, history repeats itself. Uh, and then other parts of the Arab world, from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, they had a big, deep, ancient history together with Jewish people. And I think resuscitating that relationship and reminding um, you know, the Arab countries about their Jewish heritage and the people that lived amongst them will do a lot 
in order to pave the way for increasing relations with, with Israel. Um, and here you can see already in uh, the United Arab Emirates, they built you know, a, a, a Jewish uh, synagogue beside a mosque, beside a Christian uh, cathedral. And why did they do this? Because it's a society of tolerance. And they know by building these relations on the basis of religion and monotheism, then actually you can go the next step. And the next step will be to, you know, as a kind of contagion. Because all of a sudden, you're not looking at is Israel as foreign Jews, but you're looking at them as part of your bigger culture. And there you see that there is a, a great space, I think, for optimism. Um, you know, whether it's uh, the, the kind of the ancient, uh, you know, Hebraic or the ancient um, uh, Semites, but the concepts, you know, of uh, bringing Jewish and Arabic people together, I think, you know, since time immemorial. It's the last 70 years that are the, uh, uh, the exception. Um, it's the centuries before of uh, more or less, I mean, of course, there were violent episodes as well, but uh, more or less in the centuries before, uh, there was a, a, a deeper uh, connection between Jewish people and uh, Arab. Well, is, there, is it not true that the Quran speaks of uh, Christians and Jews should be respected as fellow people of the book? Uh, and, uh, and so if, if the Quran is in fact the word of God as told through, uh, through his prophet, uh, then is that not the word of God to say that they should be respected? So let me just ask a follow-up question there, and that is that the religious context which has been used by the regime in Tehran and elsewhere as justification for hostility against Israel, is there not also a religious basis or Quran-based reason to get along? that is solely a function of interpretation uh, by whoever's doing the interpreting. 100%. But uh, also, in, in none of the religious uh, books of Islam, neither the Hadith nor in the, nor in the Quran does it call for Jews to be uh, killed or, or Christians to be killed. Not at all. And not only is it not interpretation, um, you can't interpret those kind of texts in a way that would justify violence. You cannot. It's, uh, it's completely against the religion to do so. Um, and when a government or, for example, uh, any of the regimes, when they declare a holy war against Christians and Jews, or uh, th this is exactly opposite to the spirit of Islam, and they are the ones who are committing a great crime against uh, God in, in, in the eyes of, of Muslims. And they know it. Uh, they know it. What they're doing is politicizing their religion, creating something called political Islam, and that snapback... Um, is why you have you know radicalization that takes place across the Middle East, um, and it, to be honest with you, it's like a, uh, it, it, like a blowback effect because in the end, the regi the regimes that have encouraged this are the ones that typically fall at the hand of of these kind of uh, radical regimes. So uh, no, you're hundred percent correct. Um, uh, this is um, an insult, I think, to their religion as well. Uh, those who misuse who who misuse religious texts in order to justify violence or to justify uh, non-engagement with uh, Israel and with Jewish people. Well, let me turn to uh, uh, Thomas, and um, it, it, the topic of this panel is the future of the Middle East uh, after the Abraham Accords. You can't talk about the future of the Middle East without talking about Saudi Arabia. So let's zero in on that for the, for a couple more minutes. Um, the Saudi Qatar conflict has settled down. Uh, but we still have uh, a conflict in Yemen, which is directly that's resulted in uh, rockets, Iranian-made rockets being fired into Riyadh and, and elsewhere. At the same time, we have Mohammed bin Salman uh, and the steps that he is taking um, in radical changes in Saudi society. Um, what role will Saudi Arabia play in the short and medium term in this Middle East that follows the Abraham Accords? Well, it goes without saying a, a big role, <laughs> but um, I, I think, as, as we've already touched upon, naturally they were involved in behind the scenes in, in, in discussions around the Accords, and I, th I think something that needs to be done is is to create the, the space for future discussions about how 
they may engage with the accords uh, with the accords um, in the future, and that doesn't need to be in in the near future. But I think just uh, a conscious lending of of thought to how to create that space for Saudi Arabia and other actors in the region to uh, possibly join the accords in the future is 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 going to be fairly key. Um, but again, as we, we've said, the, the nature of the Accords is fairly depoliticized at the moment. Um, it's a success. We can see it taking off in terms of economic integration. Uh, there's no need to, to, to force that issue um, in terms of involvement of Saudi Arabia in the Accords at, at this stage, I feel. Uh, but I think uh, it, we should be conscious of leaving space for that future involvement. And, and we're all aware that they wouldn't have happened if the if if MBS was anti, right? If he had given it the thumbs down, it wouldn't have happened at all. So they're clearly a player, but in a typically Middle Eastern nuanced uh, way. Uh, Tom, do you have a thought on it? Yeah, um, I was just going to uh, say again, if the Crown Prince hadn't approved, um, then it probably wouldn't have happened. And as Mitchell said earlier, they were very much kept in the loop um, by the American government the whole time. Um, we at the Pinsker Center had a webinar with Bonnie Glick, who was one of the American diplomats um, overseeing the Abraham Accords. Uh, and she seemed very optimistic that Saudi Arabia might become a uh, signatory to those accords in the future. Um, I'm not sure how likely that is. I think what's perhaps more likely is that in the, within the next decade, Saudi Arabia and Israel may begin um, negotiations on a trade facilitation agreement, um, a very light, um, a light agreement on uh, increasing trade between the two countries. We've only got a few minutes left. Uh, I want to turn the conversation to Iran and the regime there. Um, it, would it be your opinion uh, that the the regime in Tehran would have looked at the Abraham Accords negatively simply because it involves someone making nice with Israel, or would they see it as an opportunity for them to claim the mantle of we're the, we're the hardcore guys, we're the ones who are going to keep the pressure on, and so on through our involvement in, with proxies in Syria and Hezbollah and, so, and, and other bad guys? Um, what, how do you interpret the geopolitical impact of the Abraham Accords on the Iranian regime? And we'll start with Mitchell, and we'll, we'll end with Tom. It, it's interesting because it ties in also with the question about Saudi Arabia. Um, the the Saudi-Qatar issue, it's uh, in, in some ways, it's sibling rivalry. Um, every every uh, GCC country has an overlap of uh, people. Uh, the royal families have intermarried with each other. The uh, all the all the families have intermarried with each other. So, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, they have a they have this overlap, and so the the rivalry, the the uh, kind of intra Arab rivalry doesn't really exist. It's very very soft. But Iran has looked at the Arab Gulf countries. Uh, with a great deal of hostility, not only because they're trying to project a certain view of their own religious uh, orientation uh, as, as they are Shia, and their Shia revivalist uh, revolution swept in. And the countries in the Gulf have sizable Shia populations, uh, including, by the way, Iraq, which uh, has a majority of Shia. And there's always this fear that you know, Iran could stir up trouble there. But what we've seen, even in Iraq, is that the, the Shia in Iraq don't agree with Iran. They don't follow Iran. They want to be Arab. They want to belong to the Arab fold. And so now the rivalry is heating up. And I think that the Abraham Accords don't change that. Um, I think rather Iran, if you're looking at it from the view from Tehran, they're probably much more afraid of what's, of Israel's relationship to Azerbaijan than they are, for example, to the Gulf countries, because they know that Israel had a position anyways in and around the Gulf. They're the only country in the region that has uh, nuclear-powered submarines. Uh, they were able to have a second strike capability against uh, Iran since, the, I guess, the early 2000s. Um, they have a very sophisticated air force. I think where 
Iran is more afraid is the Azerbaijan relationship to Israel because it brings Israeli forces very functional. It's a very functional alliance. It brings Israeli forces right to the border in a place that Iran thought it had control over the Caspian Sea. And uh, so uh, I think that that is m maybe a little bit more of the dynamic um, that scares Tehran rather than the Abraham Accords. Okay. As we wrap it up, Thomas and Tom. Um, yeah, those are some really interesting comments. And if our friend from Azerbaijan um, over there has any comments um, on the Azerbaijan relationship with Israel, I'd be really quite interested to hear them. Um, I think if you look at what's going on in Iran at the moment in terms of public opinion, uh, public opinion is turning very much against the government, whether it's uh, women taking off uh, their veils in protest of the government uh, or just general public opinion uh, against the regime in other areas uh, and again uh, sort of cool down on um, on uh, uh, on negative relations, uh, on negative uh, views on Israel, I think that's something quite important to uh, to bear in mind. Uh, however, I do think the one thing that the Iranian government does fear uh, is a united Middle East and a united Western world with the Middle East uh, in opposition to Iran themselves. I think that's the thing that they most fear. Thomas, I'll leave the final comments to you. Well, um, just just to finish up, I'd say that. In terms of Iran, the key element here is, again, making the Accords a success in terms of economic integration and people-to-people and -people exchange. And simply, again, when we're talking about people on the ground and public opinion in Iran, that's going to have the broadest impact, is um, you know seeing the success of those incre increasing integrational aspects of the Accords. And, and I, I count any kind of free trade uh, agreements that come out of that. Again, you, you spoke of the possibility of Saudi Arabia in that regard. I count that as a continuation of the Accords, plural. Uh, just just these uh, a flurry of, of increasing trade arrangements between these states with the technical legislative changes that are necessary to promote um, uh, economic integration in that regard is just going to demonstrate um, that we've moved past the previous era. And when it comes to public opinion in Iran, I hope that people will look to the success of the Accords and that will change things on the ground there. Uh, in terms of speaking to, to the current elites in Iran, I, 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 I don't imagine that's going to have as much impact, but um, I hope that the Accords can be a, a signal of success in that regard. Well, we really have seen dramatic events uh, taking place in Iran over the course of the last couple of days as a result of the murder of this poor woman uh, at the hands uh, at the hands of the police, uh, the, the religious police or the morality police, um, which underscores uh, that while things may seem calm when you're several time zones away, uh, there are complicated forces that continue to be at work uh, in, uh, uh, in, in that country with broader implications uh, for the region. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, I hope that the members of the audience found the discussion helpful. I know I did uh, in terms of informing me going forward. Um, I, uh, one thing is also certain that nobody at a New Direction conference ever starves. So there was yet another coffee break uh, taking place uh, uh, out, uh, out in the common area. So uh, we're going to adjourn this on schedule and help them get back on, on time. Would you please put your hands together for the members of the panel and the great job that they did.